ego stands in the way of so many great entrepreneurs. I am the number one global top selling craft presenter on shopping TV. I don't manifest things, I'm, I make stuff happen. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Najahi Events. Right, today's guest, someone who I had an absolute blast talking to. Not only has she been a star of Dragon's Den TV, as well as Strictly Come Dancing and a new TV show that's out very soon. She's a serial entrepreneur, someone I've got a load of respect for because of her authenticity. She's the founder of the, and the creative director of Crafters Companion, a global retailer headquartered in the northeast of England, employing more than 200 people. She gained recognition for her appearances on the UK TV show Dragon's Den, where she joined the panel as a dragon in 2019. She's also known uh, for creative contributions to the crafting community. She designed and developed various crafting products and tools, particularly in the areas of paper craft and card making. Let's have a look at some of her achievements. She was awarded an MBE in 2016. She's the youngest ever dragon to have joined the panel of entrepreneurs. She's one of the 10 most admired business women to watch. Okay. Outstanding Entrepreneur of the Year from the Northern Power of Women's Awards, the Queen's Award for Enterprise and International Trade, Outstanding Achievement in Business Awards through Lloyds Bank National Business Awards, Management Today's 35 Under 35, Ernst & Young's UK Emerging Entrepreneur, and the Shell Livewire Young Entrepreneur of the Year. She's a really talented businesswoman and she's got a great personality and as I said before, deeply authentic. Cue the music for the incredible Sarah Davies MBE. Thank you to Najahi Events who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Sarah Davies, how you doing? Tremendous mate, but I would be because you're my neck of the woods for once. Look, so everyone needs to know this. I am in the north of England right now. Sarah couldn't make it to the podcast down in London and so... I agreed to come up north. Now, the car made it. It didn't cough and splutter on the way up here. <laughs> it was all just a ploy, you know. I was totally available to come down to London. I just, <laughs> I wanted you to see the sunny northeast. <laughs> and it worked out great. It's worked out perfectly. So thank you so much for coming to join us today. Now, you and I met whilst dancing on a stage last year at an event in London. And... We did. Oh, yes, I forgot you had two left feet. <laughs> And I've secretly been to salsa lessons every week since that day. <gasps> and you now, give me a spin around the dance floor. Well, I, I, wanna, I, I thought we should just start the podcast with a dance. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> now, your, 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 your story is quite fascinating to me because it's not typical. And a lot of people in the Middle East that, that will have seen Dragons then and seen, you know, your rise to fame there as, as a media personality won't necessarily know what's, what, what your journey's been like. And then when they understand the industry that you get in, everyone then says, how on earth did that happen? <laughs> because it really is unusual. And, and I think a lot of the time in business, we see companies that are successful and, and we don't think of them or we meet somebody that's successful and we don't necessarily understand th how they became successful in that industry. Yep. And, and you, to me, like epitomize that because every single time someone says, what is it she does again? And then I talk about Crafters Companion. OK, and I talk about the products and services that you've built. People are like, is that really an industry? Mm -hmm. You obviously get it. Yeah. Oh, I get it all the time. To be honest, even before I got in, into the industry, I had no idea it was as big of an industry as what it is. I mean, so globally, two thirds of all women do some form of craft hobby two thirds of all women yet it's just something a lot of people don't talk well didn't talk about it's become a lot more trendy the last few years to talk about it and really embrace it you've had a big part in making it trendy though i'd like to think i contributed even if it's just in my own little way well i think that i think that when you when you have such a big presence like you do now with various tv shows and whatnot people people are, are digging into that area it was it was kind of like when i was a kid at school we were, we, we had to do sewing yeah. Okay, so we did home economics and the cooking stuff, and then we had the needlework stuff. And I remember built, built, uh, making a bean bag, a giant <laughs> bean bag <laughs> with a Man United Red Devils stuff on it. And that was, that was class every week. But it was kind of like, 
you had to do it. You weren't really given a choice. And then, so you kind of got it done. And when I was young, you know, um, cross stitch played a part uh, in, in my life in a very small way as a boy and, and a bit of crochet and stuff like that. But crafting wasn't something that I ever thought I was doing. I think it's probably the word as well, isn't it? Because as soon as someone says crafting, you think of your grandma knitting. Or you think of your Auntie Jean with her sewing machine out. It's just got these connotations of old ladies doing, like you say, cross stitch or knitting or whatever. And actually, I think, because I was on the board of directors for the Craft and Hobby Association in the US, and one of the biggest challenges that we had was how to be relevant to the next generation. Not even the younger people, the next generation coming through. Um, when people th have that think that way about crafts, and so they quite often term them makers instead. And if you think of a maker, all of a sudden, now you're talking about trendy people who are selling their wares on Etsy and, you know, and, and I think the last few years, there's been this huge movement towards making things. You know, the pandemic has really exacerbated that. So many people were forced to be at home for a long time and took up craft hobbies. And then all of a sudden, there was all the talk of crafting for well-being and how it's brilliant as you know, a, an escape outlet. And I think what it is, because I did a lot of research with the Charity Mind, and it's all about if you have something for your hands to do and that your brain is focused on, but not something that's overly taxing. So if you think about um, knit, knitting or crochet, you're following a pattern. So you're following that pattern, but you're not so embroiled in it that you, you get yourself all chewed up. You're just relaxing following that pattern. Or you're doing maybe a paint by numbers or colouring in. And you're following some sort of sense of what you're doing, but it's not overly taxing. Then it becomes relaxing. And what I love about the crafting personally, it's the enjoyment of doing it. I, I get loads of enjoyment. It's the satisfaction from achieving something. But then the best bit for me is I like to gift what I've done. And it's that, that feeling of pride when someone looks and goes, oh, where, where did you get that from? And you say, no, 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 I made it. And it's that look on people's face when they're so enamored with what you've done and you're so proud of yourself and you've shared that with someone else. So I love kind of them three, them three aspects of crafting. You think about it, you know, people buying birthday gifts and Christmas gifts and whatnot and spending money. And, you know, sometimes people buy vouchers and stuff like that. But when someone knows you've made something for them, you've taken the time to do that. It's worth so much more. I, you know, if I think when I got, first got involved in the industry 20 years ago, if you made somebody a card for Christmas instead of buying them one, they probably would consider you a little bit cheap or you're making it to save money. Whereas now, if you made someone a card instead of buying one, it would be so much more meaningful. Mm. And it doesn't matter if it's not perfect. It's the fact that you've made it. You know, every year... I make a point of baking the kids birthday cakes and I and I go on Pinterest and I find the picture. I let the kids pick the picture and I make the cake and it never looks like the one on Pinterest. And then you get to the birthday party and the other mums always look at the cake and smile and go, oh, you made it. <laughs> this is really obvious. I didn't buy this from somebody who does them professionally. But it means so much. I look back now and I remember my mum making all my birthday cakes and you know it, you, you look back and you think anyone can buy someone something not pe not many people take the time to make someone something and if someone ever makes me something they've put their time and love into that and that means so much more than 10 times the amount of money being spent buying something mm, got it okay so to give people some perspective here how big is this industry Okay, so, I mean, when I was on the board of directors in the US, it was cited as being a $30 billion industry in, just in the US. Wow. And then crafts in the UK, there's varying different studies, but you're talking between three and five billion pounds just here in the UK. And then, you know, I do a lot of crafts in Germany. They'll tell me the German craft market is six times bigger than the British craft market. And, you know, you, you you go to various places in the world, it is a huge, huge industry, but it's almost like an underground industry that people don't realise because crafts can cover everything from making cards to knitting to the cross stitch to doing some sewing, uh, a lot of home decors classed within crafts as well, even painting and colouring. And if you think about the, the massive adult colouring craze that swept across the world seven or eight years ago, people thought that was a craze that would kind of come and go out. Never went. It came in and it's here to stay. 
And now you've got all these people who got into colouring through adult colouring and now are looking for, well, how do I take that on to not just be a, a little hobby that I do, but to really push it on and, and get more into art. So it's amazing what a pathway it can be into other things. When you see when you say thirty billion dollars and then five or six billion in the UK, you're talking about serious business here. Yeah, okay, genuinely, you are. Who, who are the big players in that marketplace? Who, who are your competitors? So it's a very fragmented industry. So if I, if I look at the US, for example, you've got a lot of very big retailers. So Michaels has nearly a thousand stores. Joanne Craft Hobby they have eight hundred and fifty stores. Hobby Lobby. Actually, Michael's has 1,200. There's, there's about 3,500 craft shops across the US that just do craft. And these are 15, 20,000 square foot sheds, huge places. And here in the UK, we only have one chain retailer, Hobbycraft. And they've just got around about 100 stores. So it's not big. However, you're starting to see, because it's such a... I guess, a relevant industry now, you start to see crafts everywhere. So you start to see crafts in the supermarkets. A lot of the supermarkets have given over maybe one aisle to crafting or you'll see a lot of the home, places like John Lewis will do a little bit of crafting. So you are starting to see it more and more the places and so many retailers want to get into it, just don't know how to because it is such a niche market and it's very passion driven. So people who do crafts, it's not a hobby for them. It's a real passion. And if you try and be all things to all people, you're never anything to anyone. That's where a lot of retailers fail trying to get into it. Mm. That's where hobby crafters have done well. They've got all their diff 10 different departments across the whole store and they are specialists in each of the little different craft areas. Whereas you just try and put, you know, half an aisle in a garden centre. You can't be serious in any one area. And so you might get people started on the journey, but you'll not be there as they continue on that path. When you when you look at the kind of whole kind of QVC space and the shopping channels and the success you've had there, do you think you have that success because it's really a show and tell type of product and service that you offer, rather than something being in a cellophane wrapper on a, you know on a, on hanging on something in a store? Yeah. So for when a lot of people think of craft, they think of going into a hobby craft or a, or a Michaels in the US and, and buying something off the shelf. We carved, so we at Crafters Companion kind of carved a different model because I knew the, when I, the first product that I came up with, the enveloper, I wanted to reach the most amount of people. And I knew that going on TV, even if it's shopping TV, so shopping TV doesn't have the sort of reach as terrestrial TV would, but you, you do get the time to explain to people what you're doing. So as soon as you can show somebody something, what I love about shopping TV is you explain the problem that someone doesn't realise they had and then show them how your product is the solution. Mm. And as soon as you can do that, people buy into what you're doing. And craft is so demonstrable. So our whole product development pipeline, we don't develop products that sit on shelves and sell off shiny packaging we specialize in selling products that sell through the medium of demonstration which means that as important as the nuts and bolts of the product is the storytelling within that product is more important so it all sounds a little bit oh what you're talking about but if i give you a real life experience so with our enveloper so this very first product i invented lots of people who make handmade cards make envelopes and you're probably listening and thinking oh why would you make an envelope you can just buy an envelope you know, 30p for an envelope. However, if I'm on TV and someone's made a beautiful card, I can stand there and say, you're not telling me you're going to put that in a plain white envelope that's probably not even the right size. You wouldn't wrap a present in newspaper, would you not? No, no, you want to make it look beautiful. So you've spent an hour making this card. Why not take an extra sheet of beautiful patterned floral printed paper that matched the card? Watch this, do, do, do. 20 seconds later and I've made an envelope and that then you compare it to the plain white envelope and this one's exactly the right size. Maybe it's got a little gusset on it. Mm. And then all of a sudden I, I, and I show people if you're into making cards, this is revolutionary, you know, and, and then it's a 14.99 purchase to buy the product. And p people who aren't even into making cards, I've convinced them they need to make envelopes <laughs> now because I've had the chance to show them my product and really really sell it to them and it's it's the power of demonstration but people tune in not to be sold to they tune in to learn they tune in to learn how to craft and how to get better at that but through that we're subtly selling them the products as well 
Okay, let's talk about business related to this then. First of all, let me just get the demographics. What percentage of uh, are women and men? How's it breaking down? <laughs> Probably 99% of my demographic are women. So 99% craft. in a five, six billion pound industry in the UK. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, and, and then if you break down that demographic again into into ages. So I tend to break mine down into um, levels of enthusiasm. So we talk about our core customer. My core customer at Crafters Companion, we call her Jean. Now, yes, you would probably associate Jean with maybe it's been an older name. So our, our core demographic, if I do take it as an age, is older ladies kind of either approaching retirement or in retirement, have plenty of time, high disposable income. However, you do, obviously, the craft industry is much broader than that. You have a lot of women my age and younger than me getting into craft. They don't have as much time and they don't have as much disposable income. Therefore, they're not as valuable as a customer base to me. Mm-hmm. So I've cho- if you think about crafting as a pyramid... You've got loads of these, we call them Emmas, at the bottom of the pyramid. Lots, this may be probably 10 times more Emmas to jeans. However, we know that to really dominate a market, you want to go for the niche. So we target the niche of the jeans further up that pyramid, where they do have more disposable income, more time, and they can spend a lot more money. They're also much more brand loyal. They're more likely to connect with us or, or me on a personal level and a brand level. And I guess the challenge for me as I grow my business is how do I come down the pyramid and engage in a really meaningful relationship with Emma without alienating Jean? Because mm. as I said before, you can't be all things to all people, but you want to try and attract as many as possible. But you're not a Jean. I'm not a gene. You're far from it. Well, and I'm, when you started, I'm an Emma. You're, you're, you're even less than an Emma. You're, <clears> young, you're younger than the Emma, the Emma demographic. So connecting with the genes was something you had to work at. And essentially that's learning how to sell to a different different demographic to yourself, yeah? It really is. And, and I think that is, that I, I always say the crux of any business is your ability to sell. And <clears throat> because I was doing so much business on the shopping channels, I learned and understood who their demographic was and then I tailored my sell to that demographic. So the the me that you see on shopping TV is probably a different version of the me to you will see on Instagram because I know my Instagram following are a much different demographic to what my shopping TV following are, for example. It's the same me. I've just learned you dial up or dial down different characteristics because the one thing that I pride myself on is anyone who meets me um, or, or I hear all the time people say to me, oh, you've met Sarah Davies. Is she just like I think she's going to be, you know, she comes across a certain way on telly. Is she just like that? And I, I love it when people say she is exactly the same because you are meeting the same me. I just dial up different values depending on the style of cell and how I, I, I try and get people to relate to me. I'm obviously a big fan of salespeople. Salespeople have a, 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 a disrespected in this country. <laughs> Okay, and no comment. And 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 they're obviously there are good and bad in in sales, and there are there are crooks and there are decent human beings out there as well. But that's the same as every industry, mm-hmm. you know. What we meet a lawyer, what does he do for a living? He tells lies for a living, you know. That's been often the case. You, we just saw just a couple of days ago the lawyers that have just been struck off by the government because they were giving illegal uh, advice on immigration papers. You see this kind of stuff in all industries all the time. But to me. If you've got no sales in a business, you have no business. Oh, 100%. But but why do salespeople have to tell lies? And that's because I train all of the salespeople in my business. And I say the biggest thing is, is integrity. You need to have integrity with your customer. And, you know, I think the reason I, I am the number one global top selling craft presenter on shopping TV. So there's, you know, I, I sell on shopping channels all over the world. And those customers buy from me because I can look down the barrel of the lens and I can tell them their life is going to be better as a result of owning this product and it seems really dramatic but if you're this is your passion and your hobby and you love craft and I can make that claim and then back it up by showing you with a demonstration look how fantastic my crafting is look how much I'm enjoying it look how how great the finished result is what they're buying is not that product. They are watching me. They want to be like me. They want to be as happy as I am. They want to enjoy doing crafting as much as they enjoy watching me do that. And you can't fake that. You've got that. That's got to be real. And I remember when, because it used to just be me doing the shopping TV presentations. And the first time I hired somebody else to work with me, um, it, she was brilliant at demonstrating. She called Leanne, the first girl that worked for me in doing this. Brilliant at demonstrating stuff. But as soon as she went on TV, it all, it just all changed. 
and I, and I couldn't understand why she can stand and do a demonstration in a shop and I can watch her and it's one way. As soon as she would go on TV, it would be totally different. And it took me years of coaching and training. And I actually had an external professional coach work with her till we got to the crux of what it was. She was trying to be me. She could see that when <laughs> I was on air, that really worked. Yeah. And if I'd hired her, she thought she had to be me. Yeah. So she wasn't being herself. She was... In a star demonstrating, she was doing brilliant because she was being Leanne. Put her on TV and she was being Sarah. We don't need another Sarah. I need a Leanne. I picked Leanne to do this because Leanne was good enough. Mm. And I can teach Leanne and give her the sales techniques, but I needed to be Leanne. So now I have 10 other craft guests that present on shopping channel channels all over the world for me. And I train them to be themselves and the customer connects with them. And because you've got that immense level of trust and integrity, the customer will buy from them totally different experience to watching me. But that's what's so good about it. But that's, I think, successful salespeople. You don't, a lot of my staff don't feel like they're salespeople. All they're doing is being passionate about something they love. And mm. that passion comes across. Mm. So important. Talk to me about aspects of your business that you've not been good at over the years. Because a lot of people get into the whole kind of entrepreneur startup business phase. And sales is one of the things that, oh, well, I'm not good at sales. And so, yeah. I, you know, if I'm not good at sales, then it shouldn't be me that does it. In my businesses, I'm pretty shit at everything. <laughs> <laughs> at least you can admit it. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, I'm, the sales is no problem at all. My core skill is I know how to find really good people. Yeah. So that's my core skill. Finance, hopeless. Okay. Terrible. So many aspects of the business I'm bad at, but I know how to find really good people. When you look at what you've done over the years, where are your strengths? What are your weaknesses in business? And what have you done to try and deal with those weaknesses? Oh, you've opened a real kind of worms there, haven't you? <laughs> I, could do, I could do a whole day talking about this. So um, a piece of advice that I was given in business a lot of years ago, and I, I'll tell you the context I was given it in. So I'd started the business and I was still at university. So I was doing this in my university bedroom on an evening and I needed a website. And so I went to speak to one of my tutors at university, the one who did the IT courses. And I said, um, can you tell me, this is long before we had like big YouTube stuff. And I said, I need to go to night classes to learn web design. And he said, well, why do you need to do that? I said, well, I need a website, so I need to, to build a website. And he said, Sarah, let me give you a bit, of, a bit of advice. You need to focus your energy on the stuff that you're really good at and hire the best people you can afford to do the stuff that you're not good at. And in this case, you're not good at web design because you've never learned how to do it. And it's, it's not your area of speciality. So go and, go and get the best you can afford to do it. And I said, you're missing the point, Tony. I said, there's only me in the business. And I, I, I've just start, I can't afford anybody. So I have, I have to do it myself. And he said, there's always another way. There's always another way to skin the cat. And I said, well, you know, and I know that web design companies cost thousands of pounds and I, I didn't have that. And he said, um, there's a kid called Craig in the year below you. He does this sort of thing as a hobby. Give him a couple hundred quid, get him to build your website. And I would never have thought of that. And I remember this kid did build me a website, 200 quid. <laughs> and it, it, it was brilliant to get me started. But if I had done that myself... I would have wasted months and months mm -hmm. of my time and ended up with a substandard result. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of advice has always been in the back of my mind of I focus the stuff that I'm good at and I'm not frightened to admit where I'm not the best. And I'm all right at everything. I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. So, you know, I, can, I understand the finance enough. I understand operations enough, but not enough to be, even once the business got beyond half a million, a million pound of turnover, I was not the best placed person to be doing these things. But I'm not frightened. There's, and I think ego stands in the way of so many great entrepreneurs. I don't, I'm not frightened to stand up and say, I'm not the best at that, like you did. I'm not great at that. I'm going to hire somebody else to do it. What I am the best in the world at is selling craft products on telly. So any hour of the day that I'm spending not doing that and doing something different in the business is an hour that I potentially could have been earning more money for the business. Mm. Now, I can't stand on air eight hours a day. Ironically, today after I've been with you, I'm spending seven hours on air doing <laughs> shopping telly. But I, I, I can't do that all day, every day. So obviously I've got to do some of the other stuff, but it's that find what you're really, really good at put your energy and focus there and don't put your energy and focus in the other places and Yes, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you don't always just do the shiny stuff, I think is the sentiment. You know, it, it's so easy to get waylaid with the stuff that looks fun to do. Mm -hmm. But you actually need to be focusing on the stuff that 
needs to get done. Now, you've recruited lots of people into your business then to cover those areas that you're mm-hmm. not strong. Um, in, in recruitment, uh, there's, there's, there's a story I was told once that really resonated with me was when you interview somebody for the first time, you'll decide within 30 seconds whether you like that person. Yeah. And then what you do subconsciously is either look for things you like about them throughout the interview or look for things you don't if you don't like them. Yeah. And a lot of entrepreneurs will say, you know, well, I employed a finance manager, a bookkeeper, an IT guy, and they were just shit. OK. <laughs> and so, you know, there's no good people out there. You know, everyone's shit, shit, shit. To me, that's not the right way to deal with it. But of course, when you're going through a recruitment process, you've really got to work hard at finding somebody that fits the business in the right way. Mm-hmm. Are you looking for skills as your main focus or are you looking for a culture fit? Okay, so this might be a bit controversial and the, and I, I can talk to you more confidently about probably the earlier years of the business when I was recruiting and what worked for me well then and then remind me to circle back to how it's a little bit different now that we're a you know, £35 million company. But what I always found is I used to do opportunistic hiring. So I built my whole business on hiring the right people even if I didn't need the skills they had. Now, that sounds a little bit... So, prime example, I'll give you... I just mentioned about Leanne there, yeah. who was the shopping TV girl. She was one of our customers. And she was one of our customers, and she ended up doing a couple of focus groups with me. So I got to know her, and I just thought, you're, you're brilliant. She headed up a big department at the NHS, and she used to do the hiring and firing of learning and development people at the NHS. Not a remote set of skills I needed in a craft business. Right. She was really good at crafting. Uh-huh. But more than that, she she was relatable. She was warm. She was a, a, a great explainer. So I knew, she, I could see she had the bones of being a brilliant TV demonstrator and a product person. I can teach her all of that. You can teach anybody anything. You can't teach them to be the right person. She was the right person and I brought her into the business. And I remember she was the breadwinner in her family and it was, a, you know, when, when I approached her and I, and I said, I've had this great idea. You should come and work for me. And I, I thought she would just go, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And she didn't. And it took it took me weeks to convince her. But if you look at it, she had a really high powered, very well paid job in the NHS with a great pension job for life. The fact that she didn't love that job was almost irrelevant to her. It was the right thing for her family. And you've got this young 23 year old whippersnapper who's just started this company can't even explain what the job is i just know that i like it and i wanted to come work for us <laughs> and i look back now and i think i can't believe i actually was surprised that she didn't just bite my hand off but but i knew get her into the company and i would create the roles around it like i would teach her everything i knew and then work out where she was better at me than me at things and then build the role around that and today she's been with me 13 years she now heads up my global product development and sourcing and design functions so she's got teams out in china that report into her she manages our global product development works with all our salespeople in the us and in the uk huge team biggest team in the business and all of those skills we've developed i have taught her to do and then she's become good and we then learn between us so I didn't use any, I didn't recruit her for skills. I didn't even ask her for a look at a CV. I just knew she was the right person. My head of TV, she ju- she kind of crossed my path because she'd, I, I was aware of her in the industry, liked it, met her, was like, wow, she's going places. I, I don't I don't really need all the skills that she's got, but I probably will at some point in the business. I'm going to bring her in. I think the, the key to being a successful leader like that is to find the right people create an environment where they can succeed that's that's what i'd at my whole job finding the right people but creating the environment where they can succeed if you've got a business filled with red tape and bureaucracy people aren't going to get anything done but they can be mini entrepreneurs within the company and that's always worked brilliant for me because i always i always say we're a we're a round hole company if you're a round peg you're going to fit in my round hole company if you're a square peg and I've learned this the hard way. And, and I feel like this is something you have to learn the hard way. But you try and put a square peg into my round hole company. And even if I think, do you know what? I really need that set of skills. So we'll make it work and I'll shave the edges and I'll make it a bit hexagonal and we'll wedge it in. Never works. Mm. And then the damage that they do, these, especially if you bring them in at a high level, the damage that they do can be catastrophic. 
it really can and, and I remember one I hired we were unpicking the damage that she did in the business for years and also the problem you've got is all of your other people around pegs and then they look at that person and they think well why Sarah hired that person mm. it's just not right and then there's there's no respect you you want them to because the problem I have in my business is a lot of the staff want to follow me and I don't want them to follow just me I want them to follow their leader in their department or their mind you know when the company gets so big you can't all just follow one person you need to be motivated to work for the person that's above you in the organization so your culture needs to filter down you put a bad person in the middle of there and then all of a sudden all of your other staff are looking and just thinking well, Sarah lost the plot. It's interesting you say that. One of my friends started a company in Dubai a few years ago, and for him, everything was about positivity. So he, he started the business. It's the biggest real estate brokerage in Dubai now. I mean, there's 700 agents working there. So wow. it's a, a big company, turning over millions. He started off in, with his brother in his spare bedroom mm -hmm. with a couple of mates. They had a good time on a Friday night, went out drinking. They worked hard during the week. So it was work hard, play hard. Yep. Great environment, successful little group of four. They would bring one person in at a time. If that person was negative in any way, at any time, outside having a smoke, in the car, bitch about some whatever, in any way, they were immediately fired. And they slowly grew the company up to 10 people. And then they started to require, hire two people at a time. But those people had to rise very quickly with their mindset to be part of the team. And what he created was this culture of success, winners, basically. Yeah. And because they're all winners, winners don't like negative people. Yes. They don't like the cynics, you know, and, and yeah. the cynics don't know they're negative. They just think they just think they're realists. Yes. You know, but you can't have that. You know, you've got to have that optimistic mindset. And that company has grown to be incredibly successful in Dubai because the environment is an environment of winners. Yes. And it doesn't matter to me about the money, okay, that they get paid. It's about them feeling like they're accomplishing something. Yes. And you talk about entrepreneurs. Lots of people don't even know what that word means. Okay? But they don't know, do they? You yeah. know, they don't even know the word entrepreneur. What's an, is that an entrepreneur? And when you look at entrepreneurs, I, I tried with my group of companies to turn everybody into an entrepreneur by taking a percentage of the company and giving it to them. And I said, right, this is yours. You can earn it all over the next five years. It's yours. It will sit there, mm -hmm. okay, as long as you take the right mindset and right approach to the business. And that seems to have worked really well. Oh, good. In your business, you said something really resonated with me just now, that everybody wants to follow you. Yeah. What happens if you change direction? You've got to hope that everybody trusts me to know that the direction that I'm going in is the direction we all need to go in then. But do you mean what happens if I don't want to be in the business anymore? Well, you think about it because the, 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 you, you, you've got a, a TV show. You've been on. You've been on Strictly. You've got Dragons Den, which has great, brought you great uh, um, media success. You've got your, your TV show with Fred, okay, that you've done, and so you're doing more and more of that mm -hmm. kind of work. There might, there might. I'm not saying there will. So all of the employees of yours that are listening right now, <laughs> <laughs> there might come a time where you say, do you know what? I've been presented this opportunity to do something completely different. It's exciting. And, and I want to head in that direction. What happens then to the business if, if you step aside? Yeah. And do you know what? I can't envisage a day where I would feel like that. However, I do get challenged on this a lot because people think, you know, things change. And, and I think that is why it's really important that as the company grows and gets bigger, people need to be bought into the vision of where the company's going, mm -hmm. not where I'm going. Yeah. And I think it's all about that. You know, I love Jim Collins and his bus analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, and I, for me, I, when I was first in business, people just used to talk about, oh, are you on the bus? Get, you know, and get the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm. And as I've read into it more and looked into it more, it's not just about having the right people on the bus. You get the right people on the bus, then you let them work out where they're sitting. Mm -hmm. I don't decide where everybody sits on the bus. Mm -hmm. I get the right, as long as you've got the right culture, round pegs, round tall company, mm -hmm. get the right people on the bus, let them work out where they're sitting. I can say, oh, over that hill there, that's where I think there's a pot of gold. That's where I think we should be going. Mm -hmm. But I don't set the route. That's the big thing now. The best people to decide how we get to that pot of gold on the other side of the hill, are the people sitting on the bus. So you've got to empower them to work out, yes, I set the strategy of where are we going, but they work out how we get there. Mm -hmm. And then they're bought into what they're doing. So that then, quite often, if we then if we part way through that journey and we decide, oh, we don't like the look of that pot of gold that we're heading for, but we've seen this other one that's round that corner through that forest, 
then they're going to take you on a different journey over there. And it should follow exactly the same that if I ever decide to get off the bus, that bus is still being driven by a lot of the people. It's still the same people on the bus Mm -hmm. heading in the direction that they are deciding between them. Okay, got it. Okay, let's just talk about a few other things here. That w- mental health seems to be something that that became a conversation over the last few years. There was there was people that were depressed. There was this kind of thing years ago that they were mm-hmm. depressed, and then there was the people that weren't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to me, anyway, and yeah. I'm, I'm 53, and now we've got this kind of like mental health stuff. And in business, we have to you know consider everybody's mental health. And it's kind of like a, a big thing with more meaning where to me, it's just well, you're having a bad day or you're a little bit sad or maybe maybe, you know, shit's not going your way. So, you know, don't play the victim all day long, mm-hmm. you know, you know, brush yourself down, dust yourself down and crack on and, and get going again. How do you feel about that nowadays, that that mental health being a big thing and something that all employers need to really take seriously and care about their employees about? Yeah, I think um, so. I. I always used to say this, I am probably the strongest person I know. Mm-hmm. And, and I I never thought I ever, ever, ever had any mental health challenges. I don't I don't get on a down about stuff. So so I and I think it's it's mindset. I, I choose that I am going to and I keep telling myself I've got no issues. And strictly for me it was quite eye opening. And I remember so in the run up to strictly when, you, when they're preparing you for starting the show, they introduce you to the counsellor that you can, you know, you can build a relationship okay. with. The counsellor? The counsellor. And I remember thinking, oh, well, I, well, I won't, I'm not going to need to speak to her. And they, they put an appointment in and because I'm busy with work, I, I ended up pushing it and uh-huh. then pushing it. And it was the fourth time I pushed it, my PA at the time, she said to me, um, I'm not letting you push that again, just so you know that's happening. I know you don't think that needs to happen. But that's happening. And that was my PA standing up to me and telling me that was just going to happen. So I met her and, you know, so you just have a 10, 15 minute introduction so that I'd met her. But I thought, well, I'm never going to need to speak to her. And then and then I started the show and it was the biggest roller coaster of my life. And the the highs were higher than you can ever imagine. And the lows were pretty shit. And it and for someone as strong as I was, I just thought it's a dancing competition. Yeah. I'd never, I'd never let myself appreciate it was going to be anything more. And I remember, I think it was this, the second week and, um, and I just thought I'm going to ring that lady. And it's the first time in my life that I've ever reached out for any help. And we set an appointment and it was for a Friday morning, half past eight before I went into the studio to do my rehearsals. And I, I was in the hotel. I went down, I got my breakfast, made myself a little tray of toast and croissants and a pot of tea, brought it up and I, and I dialed into the Zoom meeting. And I didn't even know what to say to her because I've never experienced that. So, but I knew I needed to talk to somebody, but I, but I couldn't talk. So, so she starts talking to me, obviously very good at a job, trying to drag stuff out. And every time I felt she was go- going a little bit somewhere, I'd just top up my pot of tea and I'd start drinking my tea. And we went around like this for about 40 minutes. And eventually she said to me, she said, um, you do know I'm going to keep going until that pot of tea runs out, Sarah. And eventually... You're not going to be able to hide behind the cup of tea. You're going to have to talk to us about it. <laughs> and she forced it. And, and, and as soon as she did, the kind of the floodgates opened and I was crying. I, I didn't understand what I was crying. I didn't understand what I was upset about, but I, I needed to work my way through it. And I remember thinking, like reflecting on it months and months later, thinking how many people, I, I have a cracking point just like everybody does. And, I, and I've built up such a brick wall that my cracking point's a long way up. Mm-hmm. But no, I understand that I feel almost superhuman that my cracking point is so far up. What about all these other people that need and they need to be able to talk? They need to be able to have that support. And I think it is. But but everybody's got to lean into that. I needed to make the decision myself that I was going to go and talk to that person. So I think it's about creating that environment strictly had foreseen that coming down the road and created that environment. My PA had foreseen that coming down the road and made sure that I had that relationship with her and I think as a as a business and an organization you just need to appreciate that all of your staff are experience things in different ways and you need to create an environment where they do feel like they can talk to people I remember it was during the pandemic and everybody you know I had 250 staff at the time and I remember thinking every one of those staff is 
got a different experience and is handling it a different way. You don't know what's going on in their personal life. Mm -hmm. I can only reassure them about what's happening at work. It doesn't mean that there's not all sorts of other stuff going on. And you just need to encourage them to be there for each other. And as a business, be understanding of whatever they're going through. Not try and apply a one size fits all because it most certainly doesn't. Because what works for me, what worked for me on Strictly didn't work for the other 14 contestants. You know, and, and but but the organisation had created an environment where we had that support. You you make me think about about you, and and I've got to know you. I've consumed a lot of your content. Obviously, we spent time <laughs> together last year. You you are highly competitive. Yep, you're a winner. Okay, and being a winner in an environment that you can control which is something you've known for nearly 20 years now, yep. that business and that environment, and then taking you out of it and, may, and you being competitive in an environment that you don't control, is that, what, with, with Strictly, that's what I'm talking about here. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Was that, is that, do you think, what triggered it for you? You were more vulnerable as a, and, and, being, and being also judged and measured in ways you'd never been judged and measured almost. Do you know, I, I'm all right with the judging and measuring, it was the, um, what got me with Strictly is I had to tap into a part of me that stays locked away and doesn't ever come out. Because, so in business, you'll know this, you put up the armour. There's no place for vulnerability in business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely zero space. And, and I've had 20 years of putting that armour on and nobody ever seeing the vulnerable, Sarah. Just wouldn't happen. And then all of a sudden, on Strictly, I look on that first week and... We, you, you're supposed to just let yourself go and put it all on the dance floor. And I wasn't. I was being reserved, prim and proper, Sarah. And, and you were supposed, supposed to do these, this move where, you, you, you know, you're, you're showing off, basically. You're yeah. showing off. Well, I can't show off at dancing because I'm not brilliant at it. Yeah. I can show off in business because there I can be the best. But in dancing, I'm not showing off because if I try and show off in dancing, I'll show the weakness that I'm not brilliant at dancing because the other people who are show It's like going, look at me, I'm great when I'm not. I don't mind being, look at me when I'm great when I am great, but not when I'm not great at it. So I wasn't prepared to put myself out there mm. and I wasn't prepared to show that vulnerability. And that comes across to the other people at home as being closed off because it is, that's exactly what it is. And, I, and for me, it was that first week of... I'd focus so hard on doing the steps really, really well and, you know, it, and, and being the best that I could be. And, I, and I, I weighed myself up against the other dancers and I was like, do you know what? I'm pretty middle of the road. There's a few people out there who were clearly very, very good at dancing who were going to excel here. And I'm never going to be better than them, but I can be better than these people if I keep working hard and practicing hard. But I didn't allow for that whole letting myself go and be a bit more vulnerable. And I remember that first week I was fourth to dance and I scored 17 and I was the fourth of the four when I danced. And I thought, well, that's all right because I've seen everybody else and I know about half of them. I'm, a, I'm Even other ones that were doing cha-cha-chas, I'm, I'm now thinking I'm a dance expert and I'm critiquing their dance moves. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I totally did that New Yorker better than they did, you know? <laughs> Yet they were scoring higher than me and the, and everybody dancing and dancing and they came in on the leaderboard and the leaderboard stretching stretching stretch, and I was still at the bottom and I remember getting to the end of the show and I was the bottom of the leaderboard but in my head I, I didn't think I was the worst dancer uh -huh. and it, I didn't I couldn't compute all of that mm -hmm. and it's not that it wasn't fair it's that they're not just judging how good your dancing is it's how good your performance is mm -hmm. and I wasn't performing because you were only getting a little bit of Sarah she wasn't putting herself all out there and it was dealing with that that I struggled because I had to. I was like, oh my God, this is the biggest opportunity in my life. I've dreamt about doing Strictly since I was a little girl. I, I'm, I was Bucky's favourite to be out week two. I was like, if I screw this up, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. But the only way I can get through it and not screw it up is if I tap into this bit of me that's just locked away, that's never been on show. Mm. And it was all, dealing with all of that, which led to the pot of tea and the cracking with the lovely counsellor lady. And you, everybody's going through a different journey, mm. but nobody ever knows what anybody else's journey is that they're going through. That's fair. That's fair. When you, when you think about the challenges that people face with their mental health, lots of people are prescribed medication. For me, my mental health challenges have always been saved through exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like it's, it's almost like it's what saves me. 
Yeah. I have this routine and I know that we're, we're similar. So 4.30, I'm up every morning. Five o'clock, I'm in the gym. I'm in the gym till 6.15 every single day. So five days a week. And then I go hiking on one day of the week. And I know yeah. you like the outdoors too. So we're fairly similar. That for me is what saves me. I've been, I've been prescribed antidepressants before. Yeah. And so many people take medication to solve the problem or feel they're going to solve the problem, but don't lean into the benefits of exercise. What impact has that had on you? Um, and we can talk about running and other stuff because yeah, I know yeah. you trained really hard with Strictly and that was great exercise too. But what kind of impact has that had for you uh, positively along the way? So I'm, I'm no doctor. So I, I, I don't know and understand about all of this, the, the, the medication. All I know is in a lot of places in the world, people wouldn't have access to that sort of stuff and, and they find other coping ways. So there's got to be ways that, that, you, that you can deal with this. And, and so if I look at what was the most challenging time in my life ever, as I'm sure most people would say, it was going through that pandemic. And for me, I wasn't worried about myself. It was the 250 mortgages of the people that relied on me getting this business through. Because if 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 something happened to the business tomorrow, I was going to be okay because I'd made sure that I'd, I had financial plan in place, everything like that. But the, my 250 staff wouldn't have been okay. So I felt the pressure of their future and their livelihoods on my shoulders, not my own. And that is a, a whole nother world of pressure. <clears throat> and I remember it was co I was having to cope with that pressure whilst also trying to find real life practical solutions to doing this. And if I just sat at home, I just worried. And, and I watched that eight o'clock announcement every night on TV and I just, it just became more consuming. And I'd started running six months earlier and uh, I'd started running just because I wanted to lose a bit of weight. Didn't know about any of the mental well-being, none of it. And, and I don't know what made me think I'd go and do it again, but I just took myself out for a run a couple of mornings and I found that the days when I ran I was in such a better headspace than the days I didn't so then I started running every day and then next thing I'm getting up earlier and earlier and earlier because I want to go running and I want to do longer runs and what I used to do is I used to get up pull my running gear on and go and pound the roads for like an hour on a morning and I think, I don't know if it's the endorphins flowing through your body, but I used to, whatever had been a problem the day before, all of a sudden, fresh eyes on it the next morning, air through your lungs, you seem to be able to solve it. And, and I, I, I relied on my runs because I couldn't see how else to solve my problems other than going for a run. Because for some reason, it always, as soon as I did it, clear my, I always found the solution. And so I did that every morning. And then every morning, I would, by seven o'clock, I was firing on all cylinders ready to go. Plus, I just had this burst of energy because I'd had all these, whatever the, whatever the hell running is and does it good for you, I had all of them benefits plus all of the mental benefits. And it wasn't until probably a year later that I reflected on that moment. And I was like, I, I never, I always thought running was about physical health. Mm -hmm. For me, it's so much more about the mental health. And I and I like to go, I never have any earphones in. I never listen to anything I, because I want to use the thinking time. And I don't even know what I want to think about sometimes, but I know as soon as I set off, it'll come to us. And I'll keep running until I've got the answer. And when, you, when you're doing that run, mm -hmm. you, you, don't, you say you don't, you don't know about the subject, but what subjects generally do go through your mind? Are, it, they, are they private family? Are they business? What, what are they doing? It's, it's all, the, all my business challenges. Okay. Unless I've got a challenge going on in the family, but it's generally not. It's generally whatever the whatever the challenge is in the business that we're trying to solve at the moment. And sometimes it'll take two or three runs. But it, but I find that that some people like to talk things through. Some people like to sit and reflect and think about them. I like to run, and as soon as I start running, it all starts clicking into place. S some people catastrophize around certain situations they become yeah. dramatic very quickly yeah. and, and even i've been you know a victim of that myself sometimes yeah. going oh my god you know this is huge but if i go to the gym that problem becomes so much less coming out of the gym and jumping in the car yeah, absolutely all yeah. of a sudden it's just like uh -huh. <laughs> yeah so that's not, not such a big deal yeah and I don't, like you, I don't always solve everything, but it's almost like I'm able to compartmentalize it and put it into a space where it can be dealt with at a certain time yeah. or it's not so important or or the solution is now, well, I'll call Maureen and she can deal yeah. with it or whatever it might be. Yeah. 
Okay. And I think everyone just needs to find their role. For you, you like to do it in the gym. For me, I like to do it pounding the roads. You've got to just find what it is for you. But I think coupling it with exercise, there's just, because some people might say, oh, it's not for me. And I like to talk it through or I like to think it through. I like to write things down. But I think coupling it with exercise, you get that endorphin boost and it just makes you feel better as well as solving the problem. No one likes going in the gym. No one likes starting a run, but everyone likes the benefits when it's done. Yes. Yeah. Everyone likes to finish the run. Everyone likes to finish the gym. I mean, I, I hate going in there. I, I, yep. I, won't, I won't let the trainer down, but I walk out there with a big grin on my face. Okay, ready to, ready to attack the day. If, if, if you could put a percentage, a measurement percentage on how much better you are as a business owner, as a professional at your job by going and working out every morning, are you 10% better, 20% better oh, than double. when you don't? I'm double. It's that powerful for it's you. It's that powerful. And also, it's like, so when we film Dragon's Den, the other dragons think I'm nuts because I already have a call time two hours earlier like than the lads because, you know, hair and makeup all takes time. So my call time on set is seven o'clock every morning, right? Theirs is 9.15. Just putting that out there. <laughs> um, so I get up and Even run Steve. At, even Steve doesn't need too much uh, hair and makeup. Um, so... I get up and run at 5.30 every morning that we're doing dragons. Now, quite often we don't finish on set till nine o'clock at night. Then we go for dinner. And so I'm not getting into bed till midnight. And they can't understand why I would choose to get up and run instead of having an extra hour in bed. But I know that if I get up and run, I am firing on all cylinders. By the, And I owe it to those entrepreneurs. You know, it, it's not fair if one entrepreneur get Sarah on not as good of a day. Mm -hmm. Why should they get Sarah that was 50% better yesterday mm -hmm. because she ran versus Sarah that's not as good today because she didn't? And I and I tend to find it's, I, I'm just, all the synapses are open. I'm firing on all cylinders and I'm excited and ready to hit it. Whereas if I wake up on the morning, I just know even just going through the process of getting myself ready and getting out, I can be groggy. Yeah. Whereas if I just get up and run, all the grogginess happens in the three minutes from the alarm going off to me having me running shoes on and being out the door. The grogginess is, you know, there's no, there's no space for it when you're running. It just disappears. Whereas it can drag on for a few hours if I don't. It's interesting you say that. Last night I stayed at Hardwick Hall. <gasps> Delightful. Yeah. It's a and lovely run around there. It's where I go and do my park runs. It's interesting. So last night, um, I, I usually I run in, I, I run if I'm not at, I'm not in Dubai at the gym I'll run, mm -hmm. and so I've been in London all week so I've been running. The, stayed at Hardwick Hall last night. Got there about I don't know nine o'clock. I thought I'll go out for a run tonight because I won't have time tomorrow morning. So early start. I've got to get dad and everything else, and so I went for did my run. Nothing unusual. Five k. Nothing. Nothing special. The the morning. And then I, and I'd sold myself on the idea that if mm -hmm. I go for my run in the in the evening, it will help me in the morning. It doesn't. No. I ne I need to do it in the morning. Yeah, I like to. Okay, a couple of other questions before we finish. Go on. Um, let's talk about dragons and 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 the ones that got away. Oh. Because I watch you and you compete for various investments on dragons, and sometimes you get them, and sometimes you don't. And I. I'm, I'm quite protective of you when I watch you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's not fair. Um, when when you look at the ones that, that, that someone chose another dragon other than you, yep. what ones do you think, darn it, I should have had that one? Do you know, it's it's probably going to sound a little bit corny. Or You've got to remember, in a series, we see 100 businesses. Mm -hmm. And of those 100 businesses, I average a series around about 10 investments. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of energy to put into 10 businesses. Mm -hmm. I, I probably couldn't cope with any more. And so all of my focus and thought goes on them 10 businesses. And what you do is you forget the 90 that you didn't invest in. Uh -huh. And it's not until the show comes out, which is probably six months later. Yeah. So, for example, we've just finished film and series 21 mm -hmm. and it'll be out in January. So I already have forgotten the 90 businesses that I didn't invest in because I'm just focused on the 10. But I know what will happen is one of them, will it'll come on and I'll go, oh, I forgot about that one. And and you're right, there's been a few of them, especially the last couple of years where it I was the right investor and yeah. I just knew that I was the right investor and they didn't pick me. And it's only happened a couple of times. and and But there's no point being resentful of it or there's no point holding a grudge because I think well 
that's somebody. Yeah, they 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 made their bed. Let them go and lie in it. Mm. And and I I have actually had it over the years where they've got back in touch later mm-hmm. and said I'm really in hindsight I'm really gutted I didn't go with you and do this. And I always think Cam is a wonderful thing. You'll you know you'll. Re-. But yes, it's not until I watch the show back that I that I remember someone's and think oh that's it. But I never regret it because it's not a regret that I had because. I didn't say no to them. They said no to me. Yeah. So there's no point crying over spilt milk. That opportunity's gone. Sometimes when I see people that are being interviewed before they, you know, they say, if you could choose a dragon, who would you choose? You know, no, oh, oh, Stephen or whoever it may be. I, I then hear their pitch and I'm like, you don't understand your business. Yeah. Because why would you be choosing that person? You know, oh, Stephen's digital. So we need digital. So you, yeah. know, you, you get that quite a bit, don't you? get you? that all the time. You know, and, and Stephen, St- well, while Stephen might be digital, I'm sure that everybody's got digital people behind them. Even, even we haven't Tuka. all got to where we are without having a good <laughs> team of people. Okay, what's been the best What's been the best one you've invested in? The one, oh. that, one that you've enjoyed the most? You see, you ask me that and then it's like saying what my favourite kid is. And then all but my other kids are listening. But we've all got a favourite kid, don't lie. But then, all, <laughs> then all my other kids are listening and get upset that I didn't pick them, right? Um, I think probably there's a few interesting ones. There's one I did last series that I'm still really excited about. It was called Psychic Sisters. Uh-huh. And I've never, she's a clairvoyant. And it's built up a crystal business. Yes, I saw it. And um, I, I invested in the business because it is um, because it was very profitable and I could see the potential. And she is top of her game. And she's got so much integrity. In fact, I knew that if I can help build the business structure around her, she can sell. Mm-hmm. And if she can sell, I can fill in the rest of the gaps, okay? But she, she always wants to do readings for me or talk to me about manifestation. Well, I would never... My, Manifestation. I, 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 I don't manifest things. I'm, I make stuff happen, right? But then actually, when you when you dig down into it, I kind of do manifest stuff because I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm going to get. The difference is I don't lie there on a night picturing it and rubbing, rubbing a crystal. I then work out a plan of how I'm going to get there and I'm relentless until I get there. But I guess it's a form of manifestation. And I think you've got to interpret things how you want. But for me, I take that as it's a great way to to focus on your goals and where you want to get. Mm -hmm. It's just I do the next bit of putting the roadmap in place to get there. So I think that's been a real eye-opening business for me because she's made me think about a lot of different stuff in a different way to what I would have done. Um. But it's, but it's a great business in a very growing market at the moment. Interesting. Okay, last couple of questions. Social media. Mm-hmm. We went from uh, people selling on TV, on shopping channels, to yeah. over in China, that everyone's selling on TikTok. Yeah. Um, and we've seen all kinds of various stuff that you can consume on YouTube of people doing this. How, how important is social media for you, for your business? And what do you think people should, that, that, that don't use social media need to learn so that they can apply it to their business so it's really interesting for me so so my I'm, the reason i'm asking this question is that jade's over there and she, and so she probably needs to hear this answer so um i grew up on shopping tv where people buy from people mm-hmm. and the reason jeans buy craft product from me on tv is because jean likes me Mm-hmm. Jean trusts me. Mm-hmm. When I look down the barrel of that lens and tell Jean her life's going to be better as a result of having this product, she believes me and she takes the course of action that I tell her, mm-hmm. which is usually pick up the phone, ask for item A238, seven phone pay, 24.99 on three easy flexi pays, right? <laughs> to me, social media is my way of building a connection with the audience. I am very authentically me on social media. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm happy to be me if I've got no makeup on. Mm-hmm. If I'm baking a cake and I burn it, I don't take it out and cut the burnt bits off and tell you it all went fine. I'll say, oh, look, I burnt it. Here's how we're going to fix it. Because that's real and humble and relatable. And you see a fraction of me on TV, but if you watch me on social media, you see all of me and it's the real me. And I don't in any way monetize that, but I just know that my whole business, my whole world has been built on selling products on TV to people who buy from me because they trust me. So I've always had the the 
take with social media is I don't know how social how it benefits my business. I can't tell you what the ROI is. I don't sell products on Instagram. Or, I don't. All I know is if those people can know me and like me, the real me, at some point in future, when I want them to become customers of mine for some reason, I will have that connection with that audience. So it's kind of an investment for the future for me. And lastly, you've made these TV shows. For me, I, I wonder whether you're moving into another direction. Because the TV show that you just made with Fred mm -hmm. is different to Dragons. Yeah. I understand why you did Strictly. And I'm sure that people are approaching you about doing other projects as well. I get asked all the time. and I'm that, So here's the challenge for me. I make my money in my business. And every day I do TV, people seem to think that people on TV get paid a lot of money. That's, that's a really big, that's a big myth. <laughs> the one, the very top 1% at the top of their game do. But every day that I take a day off work to go and film something for TV, trust me, I am earning less. My business is earning less because I'm, I'm not in it. Now, I, I can't be in the business 365 days a year. I need to get a bit of a balance. But I do feel like I take days off work. I use my holiday days to go and do TV. Mm -hmm. It is my hobby. It's not my income stream, mm -hmm. which is very different to a lot of people in the industry, but the same with all of the dragons, interestingly, okay? But for me, I I just love TV. It's the way I'm wired. And it's, I've done years and years of shopping TV. I just love creating my connection with the audience. And my overall aspiration in life, tied in with the business, is I want to be to craft what Mary Berry is to cooking. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you think about it... What, you want everyone to fancy you? <laughs> <laughs> your lovely little, little Mary. So if you think about it, if you were to go... If you wanted to bake a cake and you went on Google and searched how to bake a Victoria sponge, uh -huh. right? There'll be hundreds and hundreds of recipes. Uh -huh. But if you see the one that's the Mary Berry recipe, you're immediately going to think that'll be the best cake because Mary it. Berry says it is. Right. And I want I want to be that voice of authority and craft that she is in cooking. Uh -huh. And and it might take me years and years to get there. But it, it's say if you went into a shop and you wanted to buy a new frying pan, if one had Mary Berry's face on it and one didn't, you would assume that's better because mm. Mary Berry says it's better. Yeah. And so it can be applied everywhere. And she's got to that point of being the voice of authority in her industry because she's on television a lot. Mm -hmm. So this this wedding show that I'm doing with Fred it's not that I want to be a, an expert or a celebrity in weddings. It's I'm there judging the crafting on the weddings. Mm -hmm. So I judge everything from the table favours to the table scaping to the floral installations, everything crafting. I am the voice of authority in crafting and I say whether it's good enough. And Fred's the one for the hospitality and the experience mm -hmm. side of it. And so it's the first step for me in being on TV and being a voice of authority in my area. And so the scores and scores of TV shows I get asked to do, unless it is working towards that aim and that goal, I don't want to do it. Makes sense. You are exactly the person that you portray on TV. Perfect. You, you literally, in the, both the times I've met you, you've been kind, you've been humble, you've been engaging, and you've been really real. And I can't thank you enough for coming to join us today on the show. I have loved it. I always think the more you give out to the universe, the more the universe gives back to you. It's always worked for me. My 39 years, it's always worked for me. Give, Share your experience, share your life stories with people. And if it helps them on their journey, trust me, it will find a way of coming back to you. And I just want people to enjoy being in my company. I just, I just want to always be the happiest, most positive, best version of myself so that whether someone spent time with me having a cup of coffee or listening to me on a podcast, they've enjoyed that time as well as hopefully taken something away from my life experiences. So I hope you've, I hope you've learned a little bit and uh, I've, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. That's the other thing. I take so much more out of every experience of what I give. I have had the most wonderful morning. Really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.